correlation referred to above of the organism to the natural elements does not express its essence, the notion of end, on the other hand, does not contain it. It is true that for the observing consciousness, this notion is not the organism's own essence, but something falling outside of it, and is then only the above-mentioned external teleological relation. Yet the organism, as it has been characterized above, is, in fact, the real end itself. For since it preserves itself in the relation to an other, it is just that kind of natural existence in which nature reflects itself into the notion, and the two moments of cause and effect of active and passive moments, which were the result of a necessary separating out, are brought together into a unity, so that here something does not appear merely as a result of necessity. But because it is returned into itself, the last, or the result, is just as much the first which initiated the movement, and is to itself the realized end. The organism does not produce something, but only preserves itself, or what is produced is as much already present as produced. Hegel introduced a new and very important perspective that we're going to be taking, really, throughout the rest of the work, in talking about a teleological relation, or a relation in terms of the end in the previous paragraph, in 255. Now, in paragraph 256, and the, the paragraphs that follow, he is going to play that out more, and unfold what's contained in it. And so, you know, I want to caution you right away, because I know that some of the Viewers have a tendency to watch, you know, one video and say, aha, here's the spot where Hegel finally defines something. He's not defining the nature of an end or teleological relations at this point. It is an unfolding process where we're going to get something more complex and more coherent at the end than at the very beginning. But we have to begin at the beginning. So... What do we have so far? We've got, you know, this discussion at the beginning, as he says, of where we just passed through. So, you know, we, we had, you know, been looking at natural elements, what, what he was calling the matters. And, you know, when we think about what we're observing in nature, we're not just observing, you know, um, meteorological phenomena or even just, you know, geological matters or, you know, geographical things. We're really concerned, um, and, and not just in the present, but also in the past that he is, is living in, and, and also the further past that he's recounting, in organic nature. Uh, and why so? Well, because we are part of organic nature, and we live upon it because we are organisms, so it really helps us to know, you know what we're doing with it. Um, and because it is a very large and significant part of nature, perhaps the most interesting part, uh, depending on, on you know, what kind of perspective you like or what kind of person you have. So he begins by talking about this relationship between the natural elements. Uh, we saw this in terms of, say, climate or, you know, water, air, earth, you know, these very basic things. And the organism, organisms, really, because we're, you know, he had several different types of examples. And the question is, are we able to provide laws, in a full sense, that articulate a kind of necessity? And the necessity would work primarily this way, where, you know, for example, Animals that are in water have the characteristics of, of fishes, right? It's not just a merely classificatory thing. It's saying, this determines this. And as we saw, there's a kind of freedom that organic nature has in comparison to the natural elements. Um, and organic nature, you might say, can, if we want to use a fish metaphor, can kind of wiggle out of the net, right? So we don't actually have the kind of necessity that, that people want to say is there. Uh, and instead he brings up the notion of end. And he says, if the relation of the organism to the natural elements does not express its essence, the notion of end does contain its essence. And remember, essence for Hegel is not just you know, something that corresponds to a definition, it's also what has prominence, that which shows itself as, as being determinative, as being important. 
So the notion of and or it's vac, right? Uh, I'm not going to put that on the board anymore. I just assume that you you know automatically translate it. And in terms of the teleological relation, and there's nothing really mysterious about that. Telos just means and, which you know is the same as as zvak in this case, right? And um, yeah, root in French, right? And so uh, teleology would be some sort of coherent account of what the end is and, and how the end functions. So the question here is, is that, what is the end doing and what, what is going to be the end? So he says, um, it's true that for the observing consciousness, this notion, this notion of end, is not the organism's own essence, but something falling outside of it. And it is then only the above mentioned external teleological relation. Now that's one way of looking at teleology. When we think about um, means and ends and purposes and plans and intentions and all that sort of stuff, we might think, for example, I'll use you know chalk as I've so often done in the past as an example. Why is this chalk the way it is? Right? Uh, we can, you know, Aristotle distinguished four causes, four ways of, of causality. Uh, we can talk about the, the matter of the chalk, you know, the calcium carbonate. We can talk about the form of the chalk. Now we're actually getting closer to the end. We can talk about the efficient cause, you know, some machine process, you know, squished it into this shape. Why this shape, though? Why like this? Why cylindrical? So that it can be used to write on a chalkboard, right? Otherwise, we could just take a big old chunk of chalk, and that's not quite as efficient for writing on the chalkboard. It's tailored to some sort of purpose, and somebody does that tailor. So, you know, in, in the case of technology or, or natural uh, things that have been reworked technologically, we can say that the end is really something external to the thing because it has been supplied to it. You know, if we want to pick a really funny example, uh, people, you know, viewed um, the human being and all the other creatures, by the way, not just Christians, but Stoics and others before them, as having the sort of um, characteristics that they do and the functions that they do in order to be able to meet some end, right? In a very complex system of ends. Voltaire and Candide made fun of uh, Leibniz, who didn't actually say this, but Leibniz thought everything had its purpose, right? And so what are ears for? and maybe noses if I remember right. Well, they're very well adapted for placing our spectacles upon. Now, clearly there is no necessity uh, for that, that, you know, rules the, right, that rules the relation between glasses, uh, a technological artifact, very recent in time, and ears, which we humans have had for a very, very long time, right? Uh, and which serve other purposes. They're not, they're not just for putting spectacles on. So sometimes we can go wrong in, in this. Hegel wants to try to keep us on the right track, and there's going to be a tension between teleology, or the teleological relation, as an external relation that you know, says the organism is for something, and that's, the way, that's why it is the way it is, and an understanding of end, and teleology, as he's going to call this, the organism as an end, as a realized end, where the organism itself is the, you might say, the teleologizing thing. Um, and so that's reflected here in this, this paragraph. He says, the organism is the real end itself. Why? It preserves itself in relation to the other. And <clears throat> here the other is, you know, he has in mind the natural elements. The organism is able to preserve itself in relation to its environment. But we should also keep in mind that this other includes other organisms, those which would like to eat it, those which would like to prey upon it parasitically or to make it decay or infect it, those which would like to not be eaten by it, but are going to be eaten by it sooner than later, other organisms of its own kind with whom it might end up in some sort of rivalry relation, you know, depending on what's going on. 
uh, whether for resources or for reproduction. So he goes on and he says, the organism is the real in itself. It preserves itself in relation to another, and because of this, it's that kind of natural existence in which nature reflects itself into a notion. This is a very nice catchphrase, right? Nature reflects itself into a notion. Um, the natural world, by virtue of its processes, generates beings, organisms, that are complex enough to persist in their being in a way very different than the passivity, say, that uh, natural elements show, or a composite of natural elements like a rock shows, right? Uh, a rock, you can, you can leave it there for a long time and erosion will eventually wear it away or whatever other natural processes. An animal uh, will get, get out of there eventually. A plant may not be able to move, but it will certainly produce offspring or even, you know, uh, clones of itself that will get into some other better environment for it. Try to preserve itself. So, he, he goes on and he says a few other very interesting and important things. He says, um, we have these two moments of cause and effect, acid, active and passive moments. These were the result of a necessary separating out. They are brought together in a unity in the organism as net. The organism is, as um, somebody like Aristotle uh, is willing to, to call it, a self-moved mover. You know, now, self-moved not in the way necessarily that an animal is, because we could be talking about plants, although plants are in certain ways less of an organism than, than our animals for, for somebody like Hegel. All right, so he goes on and he says, um, because it's returned into itself, the last or the result, the, the result is the end. What we're striving for is as much the first which initiated the movement and is to itself the realized end. So there's a sort of cyclical or circular process here for the animal by which it is continuing its being, but it is continuing its being as a being in different places, a being in different attitudes, a being whose parts, in fact, may uh, in large part be different from, from uh, not necessarily moment to moment, but time to time, a being which is constantly taking things in, uh, you know, putting things back out, acting, suffering, uh, and acting and suffering not just in relation to the other, but in relation to itself. So he says the organism does not produce something, although it does produce all sorts of things, right? But preserves itself, or what is produced is as much already present as produced. What does an animal want to do? One of the things that it wants to do is to preserve its being in existence, and it does that through this dynamic activity through which it's related to its world. We must examine more closely this determination of end, both as it is in itself and as it is for the instinct of reason, in order to see how the latter finds itself therein, but does not recognize itself in what it finds. The notion of end, then, to which reason in its role of observer rises, is a notion of which it is aware. But it is also no less present as something actual, and it is not an external relation of the latter, but its essence. This actuality, which is itself an end, is related purposively to an other, which means that its relation is a contingent one with respect to what both immediately are. Immediately both are independent and mutually indifferent. But the essence of their relation is something different from what they thus appear to be, and their action has a different meaning from the one sense perception at first finds in it. The necessity in what, in what takes place is hidden and shows itself only in the end, but in such a way that this very end shows that the necessity has also been there from the beginning. The end, however, shows that this priority of itself in the, in the fact that nothing else issues from the, the alteration resulting from the action than what was already there. Or if we start from what is first, then in this its end, or in the outcome of its action, returns only to itself. And through this very fact, it demonstrates itself to be something that has its own self for its end. And thus, as a Prius, has already returned to itself or is in and for itself. Therefore, 
what it arrives at through the process of its action is itself. And in arriving only at itself, it obtains its feeling of self. We have here, it is true, the distinction between what it is and what it seeks. But this is merely the show of a distinction, and consequently it is in its own self a notion. Hegel begins paragraph 257 by pointing out a double motive for further examining this notion of end. I mean, we could also add the motive if it's pretty interesting in its own right. But Hegel thinks that the, the reason why we're plowing ahead with this is in part to understand the nature of, of ends, right? He says we, we need to examine this determination both as it, in, as it is in itself, so we want to see what it is for its own sake, but, and this is why I put this other part on the board, uh, we want to see what reason at this point in, in the analysis, in this point of the history of consciousness, what reason makes of it, and we're going to be focusing more on that. So what we're looking at here is not primarily Hegel's own you know, philosophy of nature in a fully developed sense, we're looking at Hegel, or Hegel is taking us along, looking at what reason is progressively able to untangle from all of this. And notice at this point, Hegel says something really quite interesting. So observing reason is observing nature, it's observing organisms, it's trying to figure out how they work, what's going on. Now it's observing ends in organisms, it's come that far, but it doesn't recognize itself yet in what it's doing. Why is this important? Well, because everything that is being said about organisms here applies to the rational animal par excellence, human beings, human consciousness, right? So the, the subject, the reasoning observing subject is not yet realizing how much this, this uh, applies to themselves. That is an insight that has to be worked out later on. So he says, um, the notion of end to which reason and its role of, of observer rises is a notion of which it is aware. So it's not just a idea, it's not just something that's coming to it through sense perception. It's a notion, it's a complex uh, conceptual, you know, systematic, uh, dynamic assemblage, however we want to understand that. But he says that it's also no less present as something actual, virklich, right? And we've seen how this, this plays out. So we, what does he mean there? We're looking at the world and we're seeing organisms that are behaving as ends. And now he says, okay, what is the relation of the organism, the end, to its other? So far he's been talking about the other in terms of natural environment, right? But again, we need to think of this uh, more comprehensively in terms of others that are also other ends, but that's going to come in a little bit later. Let's keep it fairly simple here. So it looks like there's a purposive relation to the environment, right? And that's what we call a teleological relation. That's what we've been uncovering. Now, from the vantage point of mere sense perception, all of this appears to be, as he says, contingent. Why? Well, because the two poles, if you like, the, the organism, that is an N, and its other, the environment with which it interacts, both uh, are present in their immediate being, and they appear to be mutually indifferent to each other, so that we're unable to generalize anything, you know, we, we can note all sorts of facts, we can engage in what Hegel has earlier called description, um, but we're not able to actually say anything that has the status of law, that, that brings the kind of necessity that we want. And we've seen in the previous paragraph why that is the case, because it's not quite so easy to do so with nature by itself, but, but even more so with organic nature. Now, all of this is going to be how it appears for sense perception, but none of this is really the case. Or you can say that it is such a partial perspective that the 
relative correctness of it is so relativized that it's not going to be of any use going forward. Instead, Hegel focuses back on this, you know, reflexive relation of the end or the organism to itself. And he says that this is something hidden. Uh, this, is some, this is a very interesting point now, isn't it? This is something that's going to be discussed uh, in, in uh, the rest of the work as well. Um, when we're talking about organic beings, when we're talking about you know, beings that react to their environment and that can even start to even you know, react in ways that seem to be adaptive or strategic, then we're talking about beings that have a kind of interiority that is not immediately evident to sense perception or even to the sort of inferences that the understanding might, might draw from, from that, right? Here, we're dealing with something that Hegel is going to say is actually a notion. So he says, um, the actuality, which is an end, is related purposively to, to an other, right? The essence of their relation is something different from what they appear to be. And their action has a different meaning from the one sense perception at first finds in it. That's probably a term I should have put up here. It's not just that there's a reflexive relation. This is a reflexive relation. I'm going to get rid of the hidden. You can just assume that it's hidden back there. This is a reflexive relation through action. It's not just a navel-gazing contemplation sitting by oneself you know, however one wants to picture that. The stove heated room, the, you know, the, the thought thinking itself, uh, the person mumbling to themselves off in the corner as they do their meditation. None, none of that is, unless we understand those sorts of things in terms of action rather than just thought, we don't have what's going on here. But really what we, what's going on here is a dynamism of action within the, the world but the action which concerns the organism. So he goes on and he says, um, the necessity in what takes place is hidden and shows itself only in the end. But in such a way that this very end shows, here's where it gets really interesting, this necessity has been there from the very start. We're discovering, this is what reason does, right? Reason discovers what is out there in the world for it to find because reason is already out there waiting for it to find itself, not realizing that that's the case. The end, once it becomes even, you know, you might say minimally conscious of its own existence as an end, is already being moved by this internal necessity. See, when we talk about teleological relations, we can think in terms of, uh, you know, say, ordering and technology, the, you know, the human being superimposing order, maybe God doing so from up on high. And then we can think of the thing itself as having, uh, the, the, the living thing itself, as having its own teleology within it that has to be unfolded, which is perhaps not entirely aware of, but is acting on the basis of. So Hegel goes on. He says, uh, the end shows this priority of itself in the fact that nothing else issues from the alteration resulting from the action than what was already there. In continuing its being, that is what it is doing. Uh, again, this, this should remind us of, of you know, Aristotle again. Hegel's a big fan of Aristotle, by the way. I, I don't know why people are always uh, wanting to go straight to Kant when Aristotle might be more helpful sometimes for understanding Hegel. Well, that's an aside. Um, Aristotle will, will talk uh, in, in terms that are, that are kind of similar here. Right? Let me go back to this. The end shows that this priority of it itself and the fact nothing else issues from the alteration resulting from the action than what was already there. Um, this is similar to what Aristotle calls a praxis, which we translate as action, whose end lies in itself. Not all things are done for the sake of something outside of the process itself. Here Hegel is talking about the thing, the organic thing, 
as continuing, as maintaining, as augmenting its own existence as the point of that thing. And notice that this is a very specific, also very individuated. He's not going to spell that out here, but myself as an organism, yes, I, I may be devoted to continuing the human race as, as uh, something in being, but I sure as hell am, am bent on continuing my own existence in being, right? And I'm not so bent on continuing the little fluffy rabbit that maybe I want to eat and skin and, and, and use up. Uh, in existence because uh, they taste good and they make me feel good and, and they it, it augment my being, right? So, uh, or, you know, the salad, if you like, you know, the broccoli, whatever. So he, he says, uh, it, it, you know, in the outcome of this action, it returns only to itself. Through this very fact, it demonstrates it to be something that has its own self for an end. It has its own self for an end. He calls it a Prius there, something that is prior. It, 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 you know, this doesn't mean that its existence you know, pre-exists itself, right? He's not saying that. But um, there, by the time that it is, is engaged in this, there's already a necessity present. So he says that what goes on here is this kind of being shows itself as being in and for itself which is always a good thing from a Hegelian perspective, right? He also talks about it as, as sort of producing, and this amounts to reproducing itself. And here's where it gets really interesting. He's talked in the past about self-consciousness as feeling of itself. And we're going to start talking about self-consciousness in just a, a, a little bit. This is where the living being does, in fact, experience its feeling of itself. Now, it may not have a cognitive relation to itself, right? We, we think that uh, many animals, at least, are not self-aware in a cognitive sense, but they certainly are conscious uh, of themselves in an affective sense, right? Uh, pull the dog's tail. It's not just a stimulus reaction. The dog gets angry at you, shows an anger response, tries to bite you, barks at you. And um, it's not, you know, when you pull somebody else's tail, unless that dog cares about that other dog or identifies with it in some way. Um, there's there's a, a self-relatedness, right? So all of this is involved in this notion of end. You see how much there is contained within it. And remember, where is Hegel going with this? He's not just trying to make sense of the notion of end. He's trying to see where reason enters into this. But this is just how self-consciousness is constituted. It likewise distinguishes itself from itself without producing any distinction. Hence, it finds in the observation of organic nature nothing else than a being of this kind. It finds itself as a thing, as a life but makes a distinction between what it, is in its, what it is itself and what it is found, a distinction, however, which is none. Just as the instinct of the animal seeks and consumes food, but thereby brings forth nothing other than itself, so to the instinct of reason in its quest finds only reason itself. The animal finishes up with the feeling of self. The instinct of reason, on the other hand, is at the same time self-consciousness, but because it is only instinct, it is put on one side over against consciousness, in which it has its antithesis. Its satisfaction is therefore shattered by this antithesis. It does indeed find itself, that is, the end, and there, likewise this end is a thing. But firstly, the end is for that instinct outside of the thing presenting itself as an end. Secondly, this end, qua end, is also objective, and therefore does not fall within the observing consciousness itself, but in, an, in another intelligence. In paragraph 258, we appear now to shift gears in a way, because by the end of this paragraph, what we're finding is that observing reason or, or consciousness, and actually in this case self-consciousness, is discovering that what we thought was the end present in the thing that is, you know, living, that is organic, um, turns out to be outside of it. But outside of it only for a particular 
kind of thing in this case, namely for self-consciousness, which is going to find um, the, the end in another being. So let's see how, how we, we get to that point. It says, um, all the stuff that we've been looking at so far, particularly in, in 256 and 257, where we realize that the, the end, the organic you know, being or, or creature or thing, as an end, has this intensive, reflexive relation to itself through action, where it really is its own end, it is its own essence in a way that non-living things aren't. Self-consciousness is a thing like this. Do you remember when we had a, a similar realization? It was at the beginning of the self-consciousness section, wasn't it? And we're going to see a little bit of that ground retraced here. Uh, this is a good example of Hegelian sublation, the stuff that was essential in the path we traversed in the past, uh, turns out to get reincorporated, or you might say not even necessarily reincorporated as if it had been left aside, but rather brought back to prominence. So Hegel says, this is how self-consciousness is, is constituted. It distinguishes itself from itself. This is something of the essence of self-consciousness. Are you paying attention right now? If you are, do you know you just did? You did an act of distinguishing yourself from yourself. If you ask yourself, wait a second, was I paying attention? You're taking a position on a you that is the same you that's taking the position. So Hegel will call this a, an act of distinguishing where there actually isn't any distinction. It's a, you know, uh, Untersheet is, is the thing. There's no splitting. You can't get away entirely from yourself. That's the nature of self-consciousness, right? And as it's going to turn out, that, that is going to get projected in, in other ways as well. So he goes on and he says, um, It finds in the observation of organic nature nothing else than a being of this kind. So self-consciousness, this this you know, intensively related organism is observing the rest of organic nature, which it now understands to be all these different creatures or things that are ends, and it finds itself out there as well. So he, he goes on and he says, um, it finds itself as a thing, as a life, but it makes a distinction between what it is itself and what it has found, a distinction, however, which is none. So we see this same process of making a distinction which isn't really a, a full distinction. So you might say that this over here is also encompassed within self-consciousness. Right? It's getting very complicated very quickly, isn't it? So he says, just as the instinct of the animal seeks and consumes food, but thereby brings forth nothing other than itself. You know, what happens when an animal consumes its, its food? It makes more animal. It replaces the parts that are dying. Or it takes that, that you know, uh, sustenance and turns it into little versions of itself. Think about a tick, for example. Pretty simple organism. Uh, only has two senses, as far as we know mostly a, a blood factory that takes, you know, blood and turns it into new little baby ticks. <laughs> that's, that's, that seems to be its purpose, but that is a purpose for it, right? Um, Self-consciousness, of course, is much more complicated than that. But he goes on and he says, The instinct of the animal seeks and consumes food, and thereby brings forth nothing than itself. So the instinct of reason, what, what kind of beings are we? We, you know, when, when we talk about ourselves as being rational beings. This is a total side note, but this is very interesting to think about. Sometimes people think about rationality as if it's just like a set of logic circuits. Put some input in, you get the necessary answer out, provided the, the machinery isn't screwed up inside. That's not the way rationality works. Not even rationality in terms of instinct. On the other hand, it's not like pure freedom, like you're just, you know, you can look at anything and decide to put anything together in any way whatsoever. In fact, to become rational is a process 
in which you're using what modicum of rationality you've got to work with at the start, probably provided to you in, in, through your interactions with others, as well as something that's part of our being, and you try to augment it, right? Uh, that's, that's an interesting digression, but I, I'm not going to try to spell that out further here. Uh, so he says, reason in its quest finds only reason itself. The animal finishes up with the feeling of self. Animals do have a kind of self-awareness, um, not necessarily a, a full-blown, reflexive, cognitive self-awareness, although some animals certainly seem to have that. Non-human animals, we're animals too, right? So by, you know, some animals definitely do have that. Reason is at the same time self-consciousness. But because it is only instinct at this point, he says, it's put on one side over against consciousness in which it has its antithesis or opposition. So its satisfaction is shattered by this. It does find itself, right? It does find itself out there in organic nature. It has an end, and likewise this end is a thing. But, he says, firstly the end is for that instinct outside of the thing presenting itself as end. What is the thing? This is over here, self-consciousness. Uh, finds another self-consciousness, and then he says, secondly, this end, qua end, is also objective, and therefore does not fall within the observing consciousness itself, but in another intelligence. So what do we have here? The other. Self-consciousness is related to itself. It's also related to its other in which it finds itself. 